Hey, welcome to uh, reading the Christian classics with Minister K. We're going to continue our reading on the will of God. I hope you can see it uh, by Leslie Weatherhead. Um, I don't normally do live, but we'll try something different today. If anyone joins in, um, then you can ask your questions and I'll try to answer them. Um, again, my name is Minister Kate and I've been, if you look back on any of my other videos, we've been reading the Christian classics. Um, I hope you've been enjoying the read. I hope that they've been clear and that, uh, you're enjoying the read. Okay. So last time we read, uh, Leslie Weatherhead, uh, we read chapter one and this book again is the will of God. And the first chapter was God's intentional will. We're going to read today uh, the second chapter, which is God's circumstantial will. So in um, context, he's just uh, breaking it down. We often talk about the will of God and he breaks it down into three uh, sections. The, in, the intentional will of God, the circumstantial will of God, and the ultimate will of God. So... Uh, this week, again, we're going to be reading the circumstantial will of God. And um, yeah, okay, so reading. We said that the phrase, the will of God, is used so loosely as to hand us not only in a confusion of mind, but in a torment of feeling. When a dear one dies, we call it the will of God. Though the measures we use to prevent death could hardly be called fighting against the will of God. And if they had been successful, we should have thanked God with deep feeling that in the recovery of that dear one, his will had been done. Similarly, when sadness, disease, calamity overtake men, they sometimes say with resignation, God's will be done. When the opposite of his will has been done. Bodies and glad men's lives in Palestine, he was doing the will of God, not undoing or defeating it. We therefore divided our subject into three as follows. The intentional will of God, which is God's ideal plan for man. The, number two, the circumstantial will of God, which is God's plan with cer certain circumstances. And three, the ultimate will of God, God's final realization of his purpose. I'm going to stop there for a moment. We often talk about the will of God in our lives. Um, and we talk about the permissive will of God in our lives. And I think that that's what he's getting at, what God permits to happen in our lives, as opposed to what his ultimate plan is for us. So we have to differentiate Sometimes we make mistakes in lives and in life and God is able to redeem us and to redeem the time and to ultimately use what we went through for his glory. And the thing is also that he also knew God knew that we would fail. God knew that we would fail, but nevertheless, his will can still be done in our lives. There are sometimes uh, that we have to admit that when we mess up in life, we ultimately um, cannot have the ultimate will of God happening in our lives or the intentional will of God. God intends for us to have a life that glorifies him. Let's say for the case of David, David uh, in the Bible, he was not meant to sleep with Bathsheba. And this caused a whole lot of um, turmoil in his home and affected the lives of many people. And ultimately that son uh, died. Now that was not God's will. You know, you, some of them, you know, some people will say, Oh, he died. That was God's, that was God's will. God's will intent was for um, him to walk uprightly and not kill Bathsheba's husband, you know, and to walk uprightly with God. But nevertheless, in spite of that, God's ultimate will was done in that he would be the, um, the ancestor of Christ. That was, the, that was the ultimate will. But all the other stuff that happened within his life, 
that displeased God, that was uh, circumstantial. It, ha- it, it was in spite of the circumstances or whatever he was going through, he still was able to accomplish that. So I'm hoping that I'm clear this with the will of God, you know, uh, is it God's will that people die? Is it God's will that we're, we are sick? Is it God's will that we don't have enough in life? You know, we might say, yes, it's God's will it's because it's happening. Not necessarily so if you really think about it. If you think about it, um, it is God permitting it. God's permissive will. He allows it to happen. Okay. So moving on, once again, even at the task of being tiresome, let us look at the supreme illustration of the cross. One, it was not the intentional will of God, surely, that Jesus should be crucified, but that he should be followed. If that, if the nation had understood and received his message, repented of its sins, and realized his kingdom, the history of the world would have been very different. Those who say that the crucifixion was the will of God should remember that it was the will of evil men. Um, that's what he says. That was the will of evil men. But, you know, we can agree to disagree. <laughs> uh, it was the will of God that Christ should go to the cross to die and to redeem man. So I'm not, uh, let's read on and see what else he has to say about that. No. Two, but when Jesus was faced with circumstances brought about by evil and was thrust into the dilemma of running away or of being crucified, then in those circumstances, the cross was his father's will. It was in, the sen- in this sense that Jesus said, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Three, the ultimate will of God means in the case of the cross, that the high goal of man's redemption, or to use simpler English, man's recovery to unity with God, a goal which would have been reached by God's intentional plan had it not been frustrated, will still be reached through through his circumstantial will. In a sense, no evil is finally able to defeat God or to cause any value to be lost. Let us now concentrate on the second of these divisions and speak about what I call the circumstantial will of God. We may make the matter clearer still by stating an earlier illustration and thinking of a father's planning his boy's career in cooperation with the boy himself. The will of both may have been, let us say, that the boy should become an architect. Then comes the war. The father is quite willing for his son to be in the armed forces, but a Navy, Army, or Air Force career is only the father's interim or circumstantial will for his boy. So what he's saying is that the ultimate will was hit for uh, his son to be an architect or whatever, an architect, but he, uh, It's like a pause in reaching the ultimate will of God. There's a pause in his life. And he says, okay, for right now, the will is to do this, to be in the army. That happens to us in life today. You know, we have a goal in life. We want to be, uh, go to school and ultimately become a lawyer. But then sometimes uh, a circumstantial will comes that you cannot do that. Maybe a child is born or a marriage or uh, a loved one passes away and you have to come in and step in and you can't complete the task. So that's a circumstance, circumstance, that circumstantial will that um, comes along the way of when we want to do the ultimate will of God. So the circumstantial will as a as a crossroad, as an intermittent happening on des- on the road to destiny to the ultimate will of God. 
it would only be confusing to speak as if the father's ideal intention and original plan for his son was that the later latter should spend valuable years of his life in the armed forces. Now, in the same way, there is an intentional purpose of God for every man's life. But because of human folly and sin, because man's free will created circumstances of evil that cut, cut across God's plans, because our oneness with the great human family means that the evil among other members of it may create circumstances which disturb God's intention for us. There is a will within the will of God or what I call the circumstantial will of God. And in the doing of that soul can find peace, the mind can find poise and the will can be so expressed that ultimately the original plan of God is brought to successful fruition. I think there are two parts to the circumstantial will of God, one in the natural realm and the other in the spiritual. One, let us look at the cross of Christ again. Given the circumstances of evil, it was God's will that Jesus should be betrayed, taken, crowned with thorns, crucified, left there in the blazing sun to die. The laws of the universe, which are themselves an expression of God's will, were not set aside for Jesus, the beloved son. The laws which govern the hammering in of nails held on the day of crucifixion in just the same way as they do when you nail up a wooden box. If bombs are dropped from an airplane over the closely built dwelling in a city, they pierce the roofs of the godly and of the ungodly. And if nails are hit with a hammer wielded by a strong arm, they pierce the flesh even of the Son of God. And because the laws of the universe are operating, and because those laws are an expression of God's will, you may, if you like, call these things the will of God, but only in the limited sense described. The forces of nature carry out their functions and are not deflected when they are used by the forces of evil. Those who lost dear ones in recent wars will need will not need me to say more about that. When Christ's flesh, flesh was lacerated on the cross, the laws of God in regard to pain operated. just as they do when we get hurt. And Christ accepted that as part of ordering of the universe, which was the will of a wise, holy, and loving God. He did not fling it back at God that it was unfair that the laws should operate in this case because of his character. Two, but there is a second element within that circumstantial will of God, the first we may call natural, the second spiritual. Christ did not just submit to this dreaded event of the crucifixion with what we miscalled resignation. He took hold of the situation. Given those circumstances which evil had produced, it was also God's will that Jesus should not die like a trapped animal, but that he should, he should so react to evil positively and creatively as to rest good out of evil circumstances. And that is why the cross is not just a symbol of capital punishment, similar to the hangman's rope, but is a symbol of the triumphant use of evil in the cause of the holy purposes of God. In other words, by doing the circumstantial will of God, we open up the way to God's ultimate triumph with no loss of anything of value to ourselves. Now let us turn from the cross and see this truth in a very human illustration. Take the case of the unmarried woman in the middle of life whose mind has almost closed against the probability of marriage. What, has, what was once an eager expectation becomes a hope growing dimmer and dimmer and then dying away. Now it is not the intentional will of God that she should remain unmarried. The divine intention surely is that every woman should have a home and a husband and babies. Okay, that, you know, wow. 
every woman, it is the intention of God that every woman be married and every woman have children. Let's agree to disagree again. <laughs> I know that um, the heart of most women, the mo of most women, not all, um, is that they should get married and, and have kids and so forth. That is the hope of a lot of women. And then you have a lot of women who, who um, that's not their intent anymore. That's not their hope. Maybe they have, uh, they have been divorced and they know what marriage feels like. And um, they decide that that's not the route for them, that they're more of an independent women. You have a lot more independent women these days that decide that that is not the course of life that they want. Uh, they have thought it through and decided that um, it's a sacrificial life. It's a it's a life that um, concentrates on others and possibly this person wants to uh, do something else. You also have someone who is, I, I consider the life of uh, some uh, people, let's say Mother Teresa. I don't know that that is something that she, you know, she wasn't married at all. Her life was totally given to ministry. And you do have those who are um, what would be called an Enoch, I guess, of, on a woman, woman or man who decides that they want to give their life totally to God and they don't want to do that. But by and large, I guess you'd say many women want families. Many women want families. They want the whole kit and caboodle the American dream as it was, the, you know, house, a car, dog, two kids, two and a half kids, you know, and a picket fence. Um, and then you have those these days that don't, you know, um, you have, uh, people are not going that way these days. But I do believe that by and large, the way he says it sounds um, almost archaic. The divine intention, surely, is that every woman should have a home and a husband and babies. Not careers, not education, just your whole intention. Okay. Anybody got anything to say about that? I'm not, I'm not totally convinced of that. The structure, he goes on to say, the structure of her body and the creative centers in her brain, her sex instinct and her maternal impulse are sufficient evidence of this for every woman possesses all these things. How do you know that? Are you a woman? Okay, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Agree to disagree. Up for debate. Question. Though some instincts can be re repre repressed into un consciousness or can be diverted into non-biological -bio activities, every instinct is present in every person and biological fulfillment is God's intentional plan. Biological film, I guess that's sex. Okay. But supposing that the tyranny of evil circumstances and they are evil if they deprive women of their primary uh, desires, thrust a woman into a dilemma. She cannot have that part of her nature biologically satisfied. Let us imagine, unless she sacrifices her ideals, cannot have sex without sin. Then the circumstantial will of God is that she shall remain frustrated and that circumstantial will can be looked at from two angles it falls into two parts one natural the other spiritual hmm. all right first there will be a physical sense of sex starvation for no one called sublimate sublimation completely solves the difficult the difficulty here sublimation is always a second best for the time being but Second, she must not merely resign herself, perhaps with bitterness to the unmarried state, but must react so creatively and positively to God's circumstantial will that she makes something glorious out of life, which God can use for the fulfillment of his ultimate will, namely to make her a complete and integrated personality in union with himself. Okay, um, there's a couple more pages 
here, but I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop here. This is page 14. That's just, I'm sorry, 34 for my, for my reference. I don't like to go too long because everybody's got things to do. It's just a little reading, a little excerpt from this book, The Will of God. Now, um, I think that this book, this guy, this guy was writing during, uh, after the war and he was, and from, I believe England, and he was dealing basically with the question that of the will of God, when people's sons were dying in war um, and people were losing their family members and people was, people were saying, oh, it was the will of God. I believe that he was investigating the question is it really the will of God? Was it the ultimate will of God that your son die? Let's take a look at this. Now, this is a, a good book, I believe, in many ways, in many ways for um, dealing with the question of why? Why did my person, my loved one, pass away? Why did this happen? And what what was God's part in my loved one being taken away from me. I believe that this is something that will bless uh, someone who might be grieving about uh, God's part in what part did he play in that? Why didn't God save my son? Why didn't God save my daughter? Why is this sickness upon me or, or my family member? Why did they have to suffer? I think it deals mostly with grief because it's saying, what was the will of God? It deals with it just definitely uh, picks it apart. The ultimate will of God, the circumstantial uh, will of God and the intentional will of God. So it's a good book. I'm going to stop here. Remember, my name is Minister Kate. We are reading the Christian classics. If you have a book that you'd like me to read, please do drop me a line. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe. And hit the like button. It only takes a minute. Okay. Um, and we're going to endeavor to read some other books. I want to get into some of the um, women uh, theologians and some of the uh, black African-American theologians as well. So if you, which seems to be a little bit uh, 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 harder for me to find. So if you find one, I will definitely uh, take a look at it and see if we can bless some people. I don't want to deal too much with the theology and the black uh, black uh, liberation movement and the, you know, the womanist thing, only if it's going to bless people. That's what we're here for, to bless people, ultimately to show that God is God and he is Lord over everything and everyone. Hallelujah. And that he's here for us when we need him. So we love you to life. Remember that um, we have a podcast, hashtag be a lady with KDJ. We're going to be doing starting some upward movement with that uh, very, very soon. So please check out, check out our podcast. Love doing it. And I absolutely love this reading time with you. So why don't you tell a sister, tell a friend, if you are not somebody who likes to sit down and uh, read, uh, read, and uh, you can just listen to me talk about some of these Christian classics and be abreast of those things uh, as you're writing in your car, as you're cooking, whatever you're doing. Hallelujah. Just click and listen. Amen. So I hope you have a great day and we'll see you next time on Reading the Christian Classics with Minister Kate. Have a great day.